Welcome to the fifth in the series Ottomans Online, the Skeleta Centre Seminars on the Ottoman Empire and the Early Turkish Republic. This talk will be given by Dr. William Kynan Wilson, who is a lecturer in the Department of the History of Art at the University of Bristol. Dr. Kynan Wilson's publications include The Ottoman Imagery of Jacopo Ligozzi, painted by the Turks themselves, reading Peter Mundy's Ottoman costume album in context, and play and performance in Ottoman costume albums. His book, Henry of Blois, New Interpretations, edited together with John Munns, has just been published by the Boydell Press. His talk today is on frames and fashion, Ottoman costume books as material texts. Just before I hand over to Dr. Kynan Wilson, the next talk in our series will be on Thursday, the 25th of March at 16.30 UK time, and will be given by Professor Amit Bain from Clemson University. Professor Bain will be speaking on Not So Distant Neighbour, Turkey and the Middle East in the 1930s. I now hand over to Dr. Kynan Wilson. Thank you so much, Kate. I hope everyone can hear and see me okay. It's such a pleasure to accept this invitation. Firstly, it's a wonderful excuse to get dressed up and we all need those at the moment. So thank you for that uh, simple pleasure. And uh, secondly, to be speaking at the Skeleta, so to speak, um, which holds a very dear place in my heart. It's helped me immensely uh, with my work over the years on these costume books. So thank you to Kate and everyone else at the Skeleta Centre. There's a third reason the Skeleta Centre is a very appropriate uh, place to be discussing Ottoman costume books. And that's because towards the end of her life, Susan Skeleta herself published a number of very perceptive papers looking at costume albums. They're rather brief, but astute and have been a constant source of inspiration and ideas for my own work on that. What I want to do today is um, to think about the material um, qualities and the paratextual properties of the Ottoman costume book. And I'll talk a bit about this genre and its origins and history before selecting a few examples. In particular, I'll talk about an album very close to uh, the Skeleta Centre at Trinity College in Cambridge, as well as Peter Mundy's album in the British Museum, before finishing uh, with a, a ninth, an album that is early 20th century, but bridges the 19th and 20th centuries in interesting ways. As I, I, as I said, uh, Susan Skeleter was a rare early scholar to look at these albums, but currently the field of Ottoman costume books is rich and flourishing, and there are many uh, exciting pieces of work being done, and it's lovely to see uh, many of the people doing that wonderful work here today. So thank you for, for everyone for joining. Here we see a stunning view of the Bosphorus in 1580 uh, from an album at the Bodleian Library in Oxford. And this is one of the albums that Susan Skilleter worked on and wrote most extensively about. When she was working on this book in the 70s and early 80s, she knew of only uh, a dozen or so Ottoman costume books, mainly from the 16th century and early 17th century. Since then, a huge amount of work has been done to expand the known corpus of costume books. In 1991, Rudolf Stickel published a catalogue with around 117 different manuscripts. And I estimate today there's around 260 uh, that I know of manuscripts and folios that were once part of an album. And I'm sure there are many more out there. These books contain some wonderfully vivid um, imagery, not simply showing costumes. We see scenes like this of the architecture and cityscape of Istanbul, Constantinople. We see archeology, span customs, uh, as well as figures in clothing that represent uh, 
Ottoman society in its glory and diversity. Here we see that same uh, image and how it opens out and folds out. And this I think is a good summary of some of the things I want to draw out, the ways in which we read and experience these albums and how I think that has uh, informs the, the meaning and the personalization of these images. Susan Skilleter uh, worked on the Bodleian album, but a contemporary manuscript is the so-called Dryden album that she was the closest Ottoman costume book to her, but she sadly didn't know of it. It's in Trinity College at the Wren Library in Cambridge, and it dates to 1580 to 90. It's a great example of these smaller manuscripts that emerge, probably aimed at a mercantile class. Here we see the top capi palace um, before us, the kiosks, the walls, the kitchens, the towers. And here's another uh, image from a close up from that same album. The reason I want to discuss the material qualities and the what I'm calling the paratextual is that Ottoman costume books largely follow certain iconographic traditions and styles. So um, I'll show you in a moment some of the sort of key moments in the history of the costume book from the mid 16th century onwards. And broadly speaking, we find the same characters depicted in largely the same manner. This is why I think we can glean a lot from the material qualities and the ways in which owners frame, inscribe, curate, choreograph these impersonable images and thereby make them personable and so inscribe, project meaning onto them. So that's what I want to draw out with a few examples. And, uh, but before I do that, I'll just run through the broader history to give everyone a sense of the wider genre. The earliest albums are grand and luxurious. Uh, we have a number from the hand of Lambert de Vos, a Flemish artist. This is a stunning example in Germany in Bremen showing an imperial wedding procession. And if we had it before us, it would uh, be as wide as my sort of arm span. It's a grand piece labeled in Latin uh, for a very prestigious um, context, showing um, a wedding procession. Just a few years later, uh, we find much smaller images. This is from the Dryden album below, showing the same scene, another wedding procession. You'll spot many of the same characters and details, but it's a tiny pocket-sized book, and this is one of the rare fold-out images. Both of these books were made by European artists in Istanbul for a European audience and readership. Here's another example of um, the, sort of the, the grand scale, the um, Suleimani Jami in Istanbul. And um, next to it, we I'm showing the Bodleian uh, image of the same mosque. And we have a wonderful uh, array of annotations if, um, oh, sorry, I was, trying to I was trying to annotate. Here we can see the call to prayer from the Muezzin. And so this image by a European artist in Istanbul has then been annotated by, in Latin, but probably by a German speaker. We don't know precisely whom, but um, we have these interesting projections. Oh, I was trying to be very clever and annotate, and now I am 
uh, struggling to get out of that with my mouse. I'm afraid my talk seems to have uh, frozen. Is there, is there anything we can do to help from this end? I'm not sure. I'm really sorry. I was trying to be too clever. And uh, there we go. I'm sorry about that. Um, here we see. Uh, I need to. There we go. Uh, so here's a detail showing the muezzin in the minarets and the call to prayer reverberating about in this wonderful way. So this projection of the phonetic soundscape of 16th century Istanbul, this dating to 1588. Here we see some other albums from the 1580s, 1590s, on the far left, the Dryden album, in the middle, uh, an album now in Qatar, and on the far right, uh, an album in Castle. A wide uh, European readership, we have English and German labels here, but the same figure, the Saka, the water carrier. And as you can see, some very strong, consistent iconographic details and colouring um, and format. So the image being made by an anonymous European artist, but then labelled, annotated by the owner in very different ways. My favourite being the Dryden album where uh, the owner believes this is a coffee drinker because the cup is being held out. And so they think, what is the most Turkish of drinks? It must be coffee. Then when we turn to the early 17th century, we start to find Ottoman artists making uh, costume books for both Ottoman and European audiences. We can see the Saka again on the right in um, the Sloan album in the British Museum and then another image showing an Indian fakir walking in the streets of Istanbul. Just another illustration of the diverse audiences we can see. To illustrate my point of that we have this kind of quite strong template that is repeated again and again, um, we have uh, two images that are strikingly similar but operate in different ways. On the left, we have the Rallam album uh, bought by um, Klaes Rallam, a Swedish diplomat in the 1660s, and then a similar one, uh, a similar album um, from the same years now in Berlin. On the left, the image is labeled the Sultan's Lion Keeper. On the right, the image is labeled the Sultan's Dog Keeper. So we have this wonderful way in which the artist has modified their template through the coloring of the animal to turn it in one case into a lion and in the other into a dog. When I say that the images are repetitive, I'm certainly not meaning that in a disparaging way. Um, I'm fascinated by the range of quality we find in this broad corpus of 260 plus albums and I think we can use that in interesting ways but I'm not uh, very much not judging these albums these are amongst my favorite but what we do see are the same characters appearing again and again uh, this is particularly the case with the Peter Mundy album but the ways in which those figures uh, which are rather unexceptional in many respects are framed is exceptional and revealing and that's what I want to bring out now. So thinking about the materiality of these books, we very rarely find uh, material textiles placed into them. This is one nice rare example in Warsaw, and you can see um, this beautiful purple and sort of faded gold textile um, that is stuck into the front. There are a few other examples, more so from the 19th century, and at least in my experience. Um, but surprisingly, we 
for, for books about costume, we don't often find too many instances of real fabric and textiles. So when I talk about materiality, I'm thinking about the composition of the album as a whole. And I'm thinking about drawing more attention towards the non-figurative. Unsurprisingly, a lot of scholarly attention has focused on the figurative and the figures and scenes we see are really wonderful, full of vim and brio, and they're a real pleasure to work with. What I want to argue is the need to give greater attention towards the non-figurative and to think about how that plays upon and with the figurative elements. What you're looking at here is just a, a selection of the Dryden album, that manuscript in Trinity. And you'll see that a large part of the manuscript actually comprises a series of special papers, so-called special papers, which were made by Ottoman artists. Uh, and so we have here images by a European, anonymous European artist in Istanbul in 1580, and uh, a series of Turkish special papers. Now, these are rarely published or sort of mentioned. And so I want to talk about why I think we should discuss this and the value of them. And here you can just see an example of um, how they can sort of play upon, they sort of nestle up and play upon the figurative side by side. Here we have uh, a mufti labelled uh, a priest. What I found by working with the Dryden album is there's a real hierarchy to the types of special paper that we find in this book. The rarest by far are the marbled papers in the top left and here we have a detail of that sort of beautiful sky blue with pink and red. We then have 10 examples of silhouette paper and that's in the bottom right hand side um, showing uh, the sort of floral motifs. We also have 10 tinted papers and that's the top right, this red with little specks. That's, that would have once been silver that has slightly discolored. So a very beautiful and luxurious effect of this red and silver. We also find gold specks as well as silver on different um, monochrome sheets. And then by far the most extensive example are dribble or tree root paper. And that's on the bottom left hand side. And I'm interested in how you begin with the dribbled paper and then slowly as you work into the center of the manuscript and particularly more important imperial figures and figures at the imperial court, you find these more luxurious, special and um, surely expensive types of special paper. So there's a sense of hierarchy of character and hierarchy of paper. There's also the way in which these papers pace your procession, your movement through the album. Um, and Elizabeth Fraser has spoken beautifully about that travel books and moving through a book as a, a wider metaphor for travel. And I think we need to think about these manuscripts in that holistic material way. There are many other examples of special papers, but the Dryden album is particularly pronounced in that ordering um, and sense of hierarchy. I've not come across manuscripts with that same sense of starting with one and moving on to another. On this screen, we have the Peter Mundy album, which I'll come on to talk about in a moment. We also have um, um, an album, Amicorum, where a Western European heraldic device has been imposed upon sil silhouette paper 
And then my bottom right example, Papier de Turquie, is from uh, the De Brekler album um, and this fascinating kind of inscription upon this uh, special Turkish paper. I now want to turn to the paratextual and I need to say a little more about what I mean by that because I'm very aware I'm taking a concept from literary theory and thinking about it here. I certainly would welcome any thoughts about the validity or utility of this phrase, whether there are other perhaps better terms or metaphors to bring into this discussion. But by the paratext or the paratextual, I'm thinking of the elements that frame and guide the reader through a book. Traditionally, this has been applied to literary text, so it can include uh, the cover piece, a dedication, um, footnotes, marginalia, and so forth. And what I want to do here is think about how a largely unchanging set of images and a quite standard set of images that we can find in dozens of manuscripts could actually be given a very personal um, and individual set of meanings and readings and how we can only understand that by thinking about the non-figurative and the figurative together. So thinking about how these books open and close and how this might set up our reading. I'll focus on the Peter Mundy album, but there's a few others I just want to drop in um, and discuss. For example, here we see uh, the Sloan album uh, now in the British Museum, part of Han Sir Hans Sloan's own collection dated 1622. And it begins with this wonderful cut paper motif of uh, a kiosk. It's the only cut paper motif in this album. And it sort of sets the stage, sets the scene for a procession of characters that are to come. Equally, we find this fascinating frontispiece in a manuscript now in Jerusalem. And I show you one image of um, women and children going to the bathhouse. This is a, a very typical scene and I could show you 12 plus manuscripts from the same decade that are near identical. So the image itself, as charming and wonderful as it is, isn't unique. But the opening frontispiece to this manuscript absolutely is. It says in French, the 25th of June, 1587, I was made in Constantinople. And so I think I'm really fascinated about the questions that this raises and the way in which that changes the set of images that are to come, the way the manuscript takes on this voice, speaks to the reader, invokes authenticity and immediacy, claiming to be from a very specific day, when, as I say, I could point to dozens of manuscripts from the 1580s that are exactly the same and have the same sets of images, probably by the same, to, in many cases, I believe by the same artist or artistic studio. Here is another uh, example of that, the Dryden album on the left, showing the famous ancient bronze three-headed serpent in the Hippodrome in Istanbul. On the right, I'm afraid it's a very poor image and it's a manuscript I've not had the chance to see myself. It's in St. Petersburg at the Hermitage. Um, and the owner has added some musical notation to it. So a very different inscription uh, and thus a very different set of potential meanings and readings. But I want to come on to um, the Peter Mundy album, which is a particularly rich and complex manuscript that I've um, published on before and I'm working on a lot at the moment. Peter Mundy uh, was a Cornish uh, merchant and traveler 
who spent the majority of his life traveling around the Mediterranean and then on to India, China, Japan, back through Russia and the Baltic before um, seeing out his final days in, um, in England. He has left an exceptional um, travel uh, account of his travels and it runs into several volumes published by the Hakluyt Society in the early 20th century. So we know a huge amount about him and his travels. His first great travel, according to himself, is his time in Istanbul. From 1617 to 1620, he was working um, for the Levant Company in Istanbul. And in his time there, he acquired a set of 59 miniatures uh, made by an Ottoman artist. And he, he dates them to, he says in 1618 that he purchased them. And exceptionally, this manuscript survives in the British Museum. Now, traditionally, the whole manuscript has been dated 1618 because the frontispiece, uh, because in, sorry, not in the frontispiece, elsewhere, Mundi talks about acquiring a book of Ottoman costume in 1618. But in fact, the compilation of the manuscript took place many decades later. And that by looking at the travel account, the text that you can also see alongside these images, I've been able to piece together a much more complex compilation whereby actually it's clear he was working on this post 1647. Um, so he's reflecting back on his earlier time as a young man in Istanbul, comp making comparisons between Istanbul and his later travels uh, in a really interesting way. So we should see this as an, a material object compiled over um, many decades. Uh, and the cut paper flowers are also from 1618 circa, uh, circa then. I want to talk through um, what I'm calling, how I'm thinking about the paratextual here, the ways in which Mundi has framed uh, the image. This is a, a typical page uh, and we see a, a shepherd, a Turkish she uh, shepherd. And there's a series of framing devices going on here. I'm not going to use the annotate function in case uh, I'm, it pauses again, but I hope you can see at the top on the left hand side above the image, we have a three tiered bilingual labeling system. It reads of the civil government in the Turkish empire. Then on the next line, a choban. So he's using a phonetic spelling of the Turkish uh, term and he, he knows many specialist Turkish words and, and really draws attention to them. Perhaps you can see a few of those picked out on the right hand side, indeed. And then the final third layer um, in English says a shepherd. So he's translating that Turkish term. We then see said shepherd, and then the figure is framed with this, these cut paper flowers, these special papers made by a Turkish artist. Then on the right hand side, we see um, the text, which is part travelogue and part history. Mundi, um, some oftentimes is drawing upon the image to provoke and stimulate his text. Sometimes, but he doesn't always do that. Sometimes he goes off on tangents. He draws upon printed histories, personal observation, and some quite sort of personal reminiscence and memories of his time. He uses six different hierarchical titles um, of the Grand Seigneur, referring to figures attached to the imperial court, ecclesiastical government, and civil government, military government, Turkish militia, 
so ecclesiastical government be, being religious figures, civil government, um, typically sort of messengers, uh, diplomatic figures. Military and militia is a little more complex. Military generally referring to the Janissary Corps, militia referring to um, uh, sort of non-Janissary figures. And then his final one, the Turkish hierarchy, is his ambiguous catch-all term when he doesn't really know how else to frame um, the, the figure depicted. And there are moments where he doesn't fully understand or um, appreciate the figures, indicating he's acquired a sort of a job lot of images. So Turkish hierarchy is this general catch-all term. And you can see um, it, it's used for general figures. And here we have our friend, the, the water uh, bearer, the Saka. There are other examples where we have no labels at all. And, um, and then somewhere he's, he knows the Turkish term, but he's unable to translate, uh, such as on the right hand side. But I'm particularly interested in the way the floral elements and vegetal motifs also frame these figures. I'm still working through this, but I think there are some potential connections. The cypress trees, for example, on the right hand side, commonly feature when Mundi is uh, showing and discussing figures at the Sultan's court at the Topkapi Palace. And a lot of European travel accounts at this time really draw attention to the cypress trees at the Topkapi Palace. Then there are other moments where um, Mundi seems to pair um, flowers such as the tulips on the left with figures more based upon color. Um, there's often connections between the image itself and the color and perhaps you can see that uh, in some of these examples that I'm skipping through. So there's not such a rigid structure as there is with his textual label, but I think he is still trying to pair and choreograph these vegetal motifs in certain ways with these characters. And he sometimes um, ends sections with these vegetal motifs. So he's come to an end of a section discussing this Turkish woman and musical uh, music in the Ottoman Empire. And so to fill this blank space, he's put in these motifs. And it, so it, it punctures the themes and topics he's addressing as well. Just to wrap up with the Mundi album, the images themselves are charming, wonderful, high quality, but they are by no means exceptional in the sense that there are many other albums I could point to that are very similar by the same artist or artistic studio. What is exceptional is the way in which Mundi has framed, paced, choreographed the, the images with uh, texts, special papers, um, and a very strict hierarchical labeling system. And all of those paratextual elements, I think, imperson personalize the impersonable element of the images. I just want to finish quickly with uh, some 19th and early 20th century variations, which touch upon some different themes. A different type of image that we find in uh, the early 19th century and mid 19th century are these pinprick images. So far to date, I've only come across these as separate folios. I don't know if they circulated in manuscript album form and thus operated in a slightly different way. They're on wonderfully thin, translucent paper. And of course, the way in which they've been made, their material property of being pinpricked also allows the light to shine through. So I don't know, but suspect that these operated as 
individual folios to be circulated in this way rather than in an album. But I want to finish with an early 20th century album that spans, that sort of bridges back into the early 19th century. The book in question is on the right hand side, um, dated 1918, but in the manuscript itself, it talks about being copied after an album from 1838. And a good example of what that album must have been like is seen on the left, uh, an example now in the um, New York Public Library, dated to the early 19th century. But I hope you've noticed the very distinctive and unique material property of the right hand image. The figure, the face of the figure is, is watercolour but the textiles, the clothing of this whirling dervish is made up of stamps and more precisely stamps from uh, America from uh, around sort of 1903. Here's a close up showing that stern, uh, it's I think Webster staring out, uh, making up the outfit of this dervish, this incredible um, hybrid. Um, we have, uh, an, this is another image showing Australian stamps being used to form the costume of this figure. So this album was made in, according to the opening inscription, 1918, but copied from a much earlier album almost a hundred years before. And in thinking about this, this cultural hybridity and visual hybridity, the stamps, another element is that this album was gifted in 1919 um, as a peace present. And as, as far as I can make out the names um, that we find at the opening of this album, are uh, figures, uh, British figures involved in the Levant Company, so based in Smyrna. And possibly this is given following World War I. And I wonder whether the use of the Allied stamps it takes on this um, added layer of um, conquest, victory, in, in some sense. It's a certainly a very complex album and one uh, I'm working on at the moment and want to explore further. What I hope to have uh, done today is first um, echoed some words that Susan Skilleter wrote about the album in the Bodleian, uh, that these books are about vicarious travel and pleasure and enjoyment. And at a time when we can't travel, I hope that there has been an enjoyable, pleasurable element to the vicarious travel of working through these albums. More than that, I hope to have shown the need for uh, spotlighting and drawing attention to the non-figurative, to the material, to the framing devices that we find in these books across several centuries and in very different ways. I certainly don't want to um, claim a single exclusive way of interpreting these framing devices and elements. I think there are many possibilities going on, but instead to think about how they can inform and alter what can sometimes be a rather unchanging, repetitive iconographic set of material. I certainly don't mean that in any disparaging way at all, but I'm fascinated by the ways in which owners could inscribe, project meaning and their own voice into these manuscripts. And I think that as, as scholars, we often will cut these up, put them into PowerPoint presentations and so on, single images, but we really need to think of them holistically and materially um, as books through which we can travel and which reflect upon travel.
Thank you ever so much for listening. <laughs>